please be seated. We are back on the record. Ms. Jensen or Mr. Cook, uh, are you ready to call your next witness? We are, Your Honor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Defense will call Dr. Mark Cunningham. Dr. Cunningham, have you raised your right hand? Do you promise or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please have a seat. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, please state your name. Mark Douglas Cunningham. And uh, Mr. Cunningham, what is your occupation? I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist in private practice and also an independent research scientist. Can you tell the court how long have you been a licensed psychologist? Uh, I've been a licensed psychologist for 43 years. Can you tell the court about your educational background? Certainly. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, work at Abilene Christian College, now Abilene Christian University in West Texas. Uh, and graduated in high, with high honors uh, with majors in psychology and also in mass communications. Uh, I did graduate work at Oklahoma State University in a clinical psychology program accredited by the American Psychological Association as a doctoral training site and received both my master's and doctorate degrees in clinical psychology. Uh, I uh, then did a one-year clinical psychology internship at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, that internship was also accredited by the American Psychological Association. And I was an active duty naval officer and clinical psychology intern. Uh, I was then assigned as a staff psychologist at the Naval Submarine Medical Center in Groton, New London, Connecticut. Uh, at that time, the, the submarine base at Groton was the primary submarine facility on the Atlantic coast. Uh, and a psychiatrist and I uh, responded to the mental health needs of about 15,000 active duty and about 40,000 dependents to the extent that we had an opportunity to uh, after we addressed the active duty needs. Uh, while there, I did two years of part-time postdoctoral study at the Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, where I was given an award as the outstanding trainee. Uh, I left the Navy and took a full-time academic position for a couple of years back in West Texas, began to practice at the same time, uh, resigned that academic role after a couple of years, and since then have been very active in participating in continued education in clinical psychology and in forensic psychology, and, and also being a provider of continued education to psychologists and attorneys. Doctor, can you tell the court what is clinical psychology? So clinical psychology is what you would expect a psychologist to do. That's the evaluation and treatment of psychological disorders. Uh, things like psychological testing and counseling and perhaps hospital consultations with, you know, with children, adolescents, adults, couples, families. Can you tell the court what is forensic psychology? So forensic psychology is any way that psychology as a science can be helpful to some issue before the court. That's all the way from evaluation of parenting capabilities in child custody cases or psychological injuries in civil cases or in criminal cases, things like competency to stand trial or mental state at time of offense or sentencing considerations such as they're being heard today. Do you hold any licenses or certifications? I do. Uh, I'm licensed as a psychologist here in Iowa, as well as in 11 other states. Uh, my practice is national in scope. 
Dr. Cunningham, prior to today's hearing, you provided me with a current copy of your curriculum vitae. Is that correct? I did. Your Honor, may I approach? Yeah, yes. Dr. Cunningham, I'm handing you what has been previously marked as defensive to I. Can you tell me, do you recognize that document? I do. This is my uh, cur curriculum vitae, which is a fancy word for a resume that reflects my uh, education and uh, professional involvement, publications, uh, honors, uh, board certifications. And I believe the first page indicates that uh, your uh, CV is current as of uh, August of this year, is that correct? August 24th. Your Honor, at this time I would move to admit uh, defense exhibit I. No objection, Your Honor. Uh, defense I is admitted. Dr. Cunningham, I want to briefly review with the court some of the highlights of your CV, if that's all right with you. Certainly. As outlining your CV, Dr. Cunningham, you've received numerous awards for your scholarly contributions and exemplary professional practice. Most recently, you were the recipient of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology Award for distinguished contributions to forensic psychology in November of 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. That's the most recent recognition. And that is, in fact, the highest honor bestowed by the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. Is that correct? That's correct. The, the American Academy of Forensic Psychology is the scholarly association of board-certified forensic psychologists. Uh, there are only 350 board-certified forensic psychologists in the United States. Uh, it's an extraordinarily uh, arduous credential to obtain. And those individuals represent uh, the, the practice at the highest levels. Uh, and those that are responsible for a good deal of the scholarship and research uh, regarding forensic psychology. So for my colleagues to identify me with this award, which is given to one psychologist annually or less often, uh, for them to recognize me is particularly meaningful. In January of 2019, you were recognized with the American Correctional Association, Peter P. Leggings Research Award, which is also the highest honor bestowed by the American Correctional Association for a corrections researcher. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And, and that was in recognition to uh, numerous research projects that my colleagues and I have conducted in prison systems around the United States um, with samples ranging from dozens to 50,000 inmates. And in 2012, you were the recipient of the National Register of Health Services Psychologists A.M. Wellner Ph.D. Lifetime Achievement Award, which was, again, the highest honor bestowed from among 12,000 registrant psychologists. Is that correct? That's correct. Dr. Cunningham, do you hold any fellowships? Uh, so I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. That means I'm board certified in forensic psychology. I'm also a fellow of the American Academy of Clinical Psychology that reflects that board certification in clinical psychology, both of those by the American Board of Professional Psychology, which is the board certification organization that's recognized by the American Psychological Association. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Uh, that's a distinction that requires election by the Council of Representatives of the American Psychological Association, uh, and it reflects uh, unusual and outstanding contributions to the practice and science of psychology on a national level. Dr. Cunningham, you are the author of 58 professional publications, including two books or edited volumes on capital sentencing and a chapter entitled Miller Evaluations, which I think is particularly pertinent in this case, in a book, The Rutledge Encyclopedia of Psychology in the Real World, Psychology and Law. Is that correct? Oh, yes, sir. Actually, I'm, I'm the author of one book, and then I was the editor of a special edition of a peer-reviewed journal examining capital sentencing issues. So it's kind of like a book, but not quite. Uh, and, and then that book chapter on Miller Evaluations is among my scholarly publications. During the course of your distinguished career, Dr. Cunningham, you have twice provided testimony to the Texas State Senate Criminal Justice Committee, and in addition to the Illinois Governor's Commission on Capital Sentencing. Is that correct? That's correct. 
In the course of your career, Dr. Cunningham, how many capital or murder cases have you worked on? So I've worked on over 500 murder cases. Uh, I've testified at sentencing trials in about 240 death penalty cases uh, around the United States. Uh, I've, I've testified at various levels in, in appellate proceedings in capital cases uh, well over 100 times. And then there are numerous other cases that were not death penalty in nature, still uh, homicides, uh, uh, that I've worked on as well. Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask the court to recognize Dr. Mark Cunningham as an expert in the fields of clinical and forensic psychology. Judge, I don't think that's actually necessary under our rules. I mean, he's qualified by his own um, background. I don't know that the court needs to recognize him as such. Well, in case I do, I will recognize him as an expert in those fields, Mr. Cook and Mr. Brown. Dr. Cunningham, earlier this year, I reached out to you to see if you'd be able to offer your expertise in this case. Is that correct? Yes, sir, on June the 6th of this year. And we'll detail for the court the specific work that you did in the case here in a moment. But as part of your work, did you author a report regarding an evaluation that you conducted on Jeremy Goodale? I did. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Dr. Cunningham, I'm handing you what I have previously marked as Defense Exhibit H. Would you take a look at that document, please? This is the report that I prepared of my findings in this case, dated October 31st, 2023. Uh, Your Honor, at this time I would move to admit uh, Defense Exhibit H. Any objection to Defense Exhibit H? No objection, Your Honor. Uh, Defense Exhibit H is admitted. Dr. Cunningham, uh, as part of your testimony here today, I understand that you've prepared some PowerPoint slides to assist the court in understanding your expert analysis. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, your Honor, um, I would move to admit Dr. Cunningham's slide deck as a demonstrative exhibit at this time and request permission to publish to the court as we go through direct uh, testimony with Dr. Cunningham. Any objection from the state? Is this derived from something? Is this derived from his report? Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything coming from the slash from the report, Your Honor. No, no, no objection. Uh, Mr. Cook, you may uh, publish and use as demonstrative uh, those exhibits or those uh, slides. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, uh, let's start with the focus of your evaluation. What were you asked to do in this case? So I was asked to evaluate two issues. Uh, I was asked to evaluate the implications of his immaturity. Uh, and, and that's more broadly a, a concept called mitigation or moral culpability, you know, the raw materials that one brings to decision making. So I was asked to evaluate his immaturity and the implications of that. Uh, I was also asked to evaluate uh, his likelihood of a successful adjustment to the community someday when he's released. Uh, the formal discussion of that or the formal title of that is parole recidivism. We could also think of that like rehabilitation. What's the potential that he will be re rehabilitated such that on release to the community, uh, he will not engage in criminality or criminal violence? Immaturity and rehabilitation, are these the only two issues, the totality, are these two issues, I should say, the totality of sentencing considerations as understood by forensic psychologists? No, they're not. Please describe the others and why, uh, as you sit here today, you are not addressing those other issues. Certainly. So as understood by forensic psychologists, there are four primary sentencing issues. The first is retribution. Uh, what's the consequence or punishment uh, for a given offense? Uh, a decision about what's the appropriate punishment, what are the needs of justice, uh, that's a social value that a psychologist has no particular expertise in. Uh, and so because that's not an issue that can be informed by psychological methods or science, then I'm not speaking to that. That's an issue before the court, but not one that, that I can address. Uh, then the second uh, sentencing issue is general deterrence. 
That's the message that's sent to society about whether a, a given act will be tolerated. Uh, again, that notion of general deterrence is a social issue. It's not one that a psychologist has particular expertise in. Uh, and so I'm not going to be uh, responding to that. The next two, the ones I am responding to, what resources can be brought to decision making and essentially a violence risk assessment projected into the future, what's the likelihood that uh, Jeremy Goodell would commit acts of violence in the community someday if released, those can be informed by psychological science and methods. Dr. Cunningham, in obtaining the history that informs this evaluation, please detail the interviews that you performed in this case. Certainly. Uh, so I, I talked to Jeremy Goodale on uh, three occasions. I talked to Jeremy for four hours on August the 10th, just under four hours on August the 17th, uh, and for three and a half hours on September the 1st. Uh, those interviews were performed by, by video. Uh, then I interviewed his father, Dean. I talked to him for 106 minutes by phone on August the 26th. Uh, the next day, I talked to him for just over two hours by phone. Uh, I then interviewed Jackie, uh, talked to her the first time for two and a half hours, 155 minutes on August the 26th. Talked to her for about an hour and a half uh, several days later on August the 29th. And then I also interviewed Sophia, uh, his older, another older sister, for just over two hours on September the 20th. Did you also review records in this case? I did. Are those detailed in the sentencing report that you filed? They are. Dr. Cunningham, let me turn to the first arena or focus of your evaluation. Is moral culpability as a sentencing consideration discussed on pages eight and nine of your report? Yes, sir. Please explain what you mean by moral culpability. So moral culpability is a term of art that captures this idea of the resources that one brings to decision making. And, and by term of art, I mean it's a concept, it's a term that's understood by the combination of the words. It's not about morality per se, and it's not about culpability per se, like is he guilty or not, or does he face punishment or not, but instead it's a combined term, uh, much like my highest degree is a PhD, that's a doctor of philosophy. That's a term of art. I've actually never even had a course in philosophy, but a, a PhD or a doctor of philosophy degree is the highest degree given in any specialty area in any academic area. So you get a doctor of philosophy in chemistry, a doctor of philosophy in mathematics, a doctor of philosophy in English, doctor of philosophy in psychology. So it's a term of art. Uh, you're a jurist doctor. Don't treat me patients, but that JD is a term of art. And that's what moral culpability is. It's best understood or we understand it not from the separate words, but from the combined meaning that those give. Dr. Cunningham, from your scholarship and experience, is it important that the mental health expert to have, for the uh, mental health expert to have an understanding of the relationship between developmental factors to choose and the moral culpability? Well, absolutely, and, and this is something that is fundamental to what psychology can illuminate in a sentencing proceedings. Uh, and, and that's how are the resources that this individual brought to his decision making, to his self-control, to his moral reasoning, how are those impaired or lessened or impacted uh, by the life events and resources that he brought to that decision making? Uh, it's, it's what the Supreme Court has referred to as the diverse frailties of mankind. In other words, that, that a given offense by two separate individuals, as we look at moral culpability, is not the same because those two individuals may differ significantly in their diverse frailties and the raw materials they brought to that decision making. So moral culpability uh, or immaturity for that matter, is not something that's either present or absent. 
It's, it's not, it's what psychologists would, would say, it's not a dichotomous variable. It's not two different things. Instead, it's, on a, it's not either or, it's on a continuum of capability that's brought to decision making. Dr. Cunningham, as understood by a forensic psychologist undertaking an analysis of moral culpability for sentencing, what factors are fundamental to the moral culpability of a youthful offender? Well, those, those have to do with the relative uh, degree of immaturity that may be present, as well as adverse factors. I mean, so, so there's a certain level of immaturity that may be a function of age alone. And then there's also what adversities may have happened in this individual's background that would act to reduce the functional maturity that that individual can bring to bear. Dr. Cunningham, it appears that you have a model uh, that perhaps reflects the relationship between developmental factors of immaturity, choice, and moral culpability. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you describe the model for the court, please? Certainly. So on this graphic, there's a scale of moral culpability from high to low. And then we have a horizontal line that has choice on it. And then we have immaturity and adverse factors. Well, the relationship of these is, is that as the immaturity and adversity increases, that choice is, is increasingly pathologically inclined and moral culpability is correspondingly reduced. So greater immaturity and adversity, steeper angle of the choice, the lower the level of moral culpability. Now, there's still a choice, but clearly the person who has a choice on this line is very different than that individual whose choice rests on a flat line in terms of the resources they brought to bear. Dr. Cunningham, as we consider Jeremy's youthfulness and the presence of adverse developmental factors in his background, can you please explain the nexus between adverse developmental factors and bad outcomes in adulthood, including criminal violence and even murder? Certainly. So there are, are two ways that we might think of that, or two analogies. Uh, as we think about the relationship between childhood uh, uh, and then teen and adult outcomes. So one perspective is that it's like a gunshot, where there is a clear and very obvious trajectory between the events that happened in childhood and the outcome that this person expresses. So for example, uh, uh, Johnny sees his father beat his mother in a very particular way, saying particularly demeaning things. And someday Johnny grows up and he's violent with his partner in a very similar way and saying very similar demeaning things. So that's an example of like a gunshot trajectory. You can easily see the relationship between those. Now you see that sometimes, uh, but that's not the primary way that adversity in childhood affects outcome. More often it's like radiation. So it's like the child is getting a massive dose of radiation from these traumas or deprivations that they're experiencing as a child. And they may show some reactions at the time, but then things seem to kind of be okay. And then years later, tumors begin to grow. Now those tumors look nothing like the radiation. They're what happens in response to the radiation. Now, different people grow different types of tumors in different places. And so it may vary in terms of the harm that it causes. The way that we know that those two things are connected is because those children who got that radiation have a much higher incidence of cancer than the kids who don't. That's how we know that one thing is connected to another. And so as we try to understand anybody's life, and, and in this instance, Jeremy's life, it's helpful to have this perspective that we've got two different ways that these things, uh, that, that his adversities may end up impacting uh, how those are expressed. Can positive childhood experiences also have this gunshot connection to constructive outcomes in adolescence and adulthood? Well, that's what the, uh, you're hoping, I guess the reverse of these is that a positive, positive experiences have a gunshot trajectory with positive expressions. 
and that instead of radiation, you're giving the kid a lot of vitamins, uh, and those end up promoting a better outcome. So yeah, both of these work in reverse, but positive experiences can have a positive gunshot effect. Doctor, is there any, is there another concept that is important in understanding the connection between adverse factors and bad outcomes? There is. Uh, and, and that I call the 100% penetration theory versus cigarettes and lung cancer or Superfund sites. And here's what I mean by that. So, so someone could pose, well, Dr. Cunningham, everybody who has a lot of deprivations in their childhood doesn't end up being criminally violent, much less killing somebody. As if that that, that in order for one thing to be connected to another requires a 100% connection between stimulus and outcome, between adversity and, and, uh, and criminality. Uh, now, if we use that metric, then it would be clear that cigarette smoking has nothing to do with lung cancer. Because, see, only about one in four lifetime heavy smokers get lung cancer. So I guess that means it has nothing to do with it, since three out of four do not. Now, the way that we understand this is by the, the, difference, in, the difference in penetration, not the 100% penetration. So the rate of lung cancer among non-smokers is about one in 90. The rate of cancer among lifetime heavy smokers is one in four. That's how you know that what the cigarettes are doing is not by the 100% penetration, but by the disproportionate outcomes. And in a similar way, you know, sometimes a neighborhood is built on top of a toxic waste dump. And part of the way that comes to someone's attention is that children in the neighborhood begin to get cancer. Now, they don't all get cancer. Only a few do. Maybe only one in a hundred do. But see, the rate of that cancer in the other neighborhoods is one in 5,000. And that's why you know something is coming out of the ground here because of this disproportionate incidence. Uh, and, and that's a, also an important concept to have in mind as we're thinking about uh, how to evaluate how deprivations in childhood affect outcomes in adulthood. Doctor, what was your first finding regarding developmental limitations in Jeremy's life and their relationship to this offense? So the first finding is that the brain immaturity implications of Jeremy's age of 16 at the time of the offense are fundamental to understanding the poor judgment and the faulty values that are reflected by his participation in this offense. Does your discussion of this finding begin on page 11 of your report? It does. Dr. Cunningham, I'd like to discuss with you the primary brain changes in uh, or during adolescence and the effect of these on brain functioning. What is the first major feature of brain development across the teens to mid-20s? So the first feature are, are major changes in the incentive processing system. That's the evaluation of risk and rewards. Uh, as in, in terms of, of how the, the wiring of the brain evaluates these. And those major changes in the incentive processing system begin soon after puberty. They start in early adolescence, and they involve the chemistry of the brain. They involve neurotransmitters like dopamine. And what happens is, is that the reward regions of the brain and their neurocircuitry are undergoing marked developmental changes where the gas pedal comes online before the brakes do. And so that accounts for the willingness of teenagers to engage in risky and in socially motivated behaviors, behaviors that promote friendship or acceptance uh, or that help them fit in, that kind of thing. And so teenagers then are particularly vulnerable to risk-taking, reward-seeking, peer-influenced behaviors. Doctor, what's the next primary aspect of brain development in adolescence? Uh, the next major change is synaptic pruning. So the synaptic pruning involves uh, uh, a reduction in the neurons and connections in the brain. 
So the, the synapse is the space that is between two nerve cells or neurons. And the way a neuron works is it has uh, potentially a large number of axons. Those are receiving fibers. And then it has a cell body that's taking care of this neuron. And then it has a single transmission fiber coming out of it called an axon. And that axon comes right up against the dendrites, the receptive fibers of other neurons, but it doesn't touch them. Instead, there's a space between them called a synapse. Uh, and all, all a neuron can do is fire or not fire, an electrical impulse. So depending on how these dendrites are stimulated, that may cause this axon to either be inhibited from firing an electrical impulse or facilitated to fire it. That electrical charge moves down that axon, gets to the synapse, and releases chemicals into that space, neurotransmitters, close to the dendrite receptacles of, the, of the, these other <coughs> neurons that cause them to either fire or not fire. Okay, so that, that basic description of what's happening at a cellular level then orients you to the, that w with the beginning of adolescence, those synapses that aren't being used are being pruned away. So you actually have a reduction in neuron volume in the cortex. Uh, associated with this uh, synaptic pruning. And essentially what that's doing is the things that you already know, you learn how to do much better. The language that you can speak, you become even more capable of speaking. But learning a new language after the age of 12, that's not going to be so easy to do. So before the age of 12, while well, you've got lots of flexibility in these synapses, you can learn a foreign language just by being exposed to it just to live in that culture. Don't have to study or memorize anything. And you gain native speaker fluency. After the age of 12, you're gonna to have to study and memorize, and you'll probably always have an accent. Well, what's happened is that the synapses that were not being used associated with that other language acquisition have been pruned away. And, and that pruning process occurs from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Uh, where the frontal lobes are among the last to undergo that full synaptic pruning. Dr. Cunningham, do you have a graphic reflecting this synaptic pruning and reduction in gray matter? I do. So in this graph, you see a, the, the blue arched line. This is reflecting frontal gray matter, total volume of neurons. And notice that that, that volume peaks at age 12, and then you see the effects of synaptic pruning as that total volume is reduced. Well, ultimately, even though you have reduced volume and you, the, the negative part is you don't have the flexibility you had before, the, the good part is that you're so much more effective and efficient with the synapses that you have. So the net effect is being smarter, not on acquiring uh, uh, full adaptation necessarily, but on what you already know. Dr. Cunningham, has this progressive brain development from the back of the brain to the front of the brain been demonstrated in any imaging studies? Uh, it, it has. Uh, and this, I'm going to be showing a time lapse imaging of brain maturation between the ages of 5 and 20. And this is constructed from MRI scans of healthy children. And this time lapse compresses 15 years of brain development into just a few seconds. The red indicates more gray matter, and the blue less gray matter. And that gray matter then wanes, in other words, it's reducing from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So the areas that are performing more basic functions mature earlier. Uh, mature, ma Just a little addition. Sorry. Uh, so uh, th those areas, for example, that are affecting your coordination come online before the areas that control your emotions and self-control. Uh, and this prefrontal area, prefrontal cortex that handles reasoning and other executive functions, it's among the last to fully come online in terms of that synaptic pruning. And here's what that looks like, is you see that, that synaptic pruning spreading across the surface of the brain. And I think as you indicated uh, just a minute ago in your testimony, this shows the 
the uh, progression moving from the back of the from brain the back towards to the front, front to higher order functions. That's correct. Dr. Cunningham, what is the next primary process of brain development during adolescence? Uh, the next primary process is substantial myelination. So myelin is a fatty sheath that develops along that axon to insulate it, like you would insulate a wire. And with that fatty sheath that's developing on that axon, it makes the transmission more efficient as it promulgates down that axon. And so that's also occurring in the axons of the cortex, going from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. And it results in much more efficient brain processing. And again, your frontal lobes, the command and control center, are among the last to myelinate. Now, they're coming online later. Now, with this progressively improving connectivity and speed, that supports a lot of different features of executive functioning. And those are things like uh, inhibiting uh, things that are a bad idea, planning ahead, weighing risk and, and rewards, and simultaneously considering multiple sources of information on the fly. So you have more resources available to you more of the time. So generally speaking, what abilities come online, for a better, lack of a better term, first in teens? Well, so for example, the, the, the physical coordination of a teenager, which largely comes out of the parietal lobes, those, that, those capabilities of exquisite coordination are demonstrated pretty early uh, in this adolescent process. That's what accounts for a teenager's skill on a skateboard or on a bicycle or that kind of thing. While the, the higher order uh, demonstrations of maturity and an effective weighing of risk and rewards, that comes on much later. Can you provide an anecdotal example of this progress from back of the brain to the front? I can. Uh, so this has probably been 15 years ago. Uh, my wife and I were on the North Dallas Tollway after dinner, headed north. Uh, it's about 10 o'clock at night. I'm speeding. I'm going 75, maybe 80. Uh, and flying by. Remember, you're under oath. <laughs> I think okay. the statute of limitations has passed. Uh, so. So flying by like a high-pitched swarm of mosquitoes are four or five teenagers on ninja bikes. Based on the speed they're flying by, they're doing over 100, and they all have their front wheel in the air. Well, that's a demonstration of extraordinarily developed parietal lobes, tremendously capable coordination, and almost no frontal lobes at all in terms of the hazard that they are, the life and death hazard that they are, each of them is creating for himself and his fellow riders and maybe other people on the road. Now, all of these guys have a choice about doing this. They aren't popping their wheels in the air accidentally. They are deliberately doing this, exercising choice but with a very impaired calculus about the risk benefit. Now I'm sure it's thrilling. I'm sure the reward part of this is powerful, but it's so profoundly defective in its judgment against what the potential cost of that are. Doctor, you had mentioned the frontal lobes, what you termed to be the command and control center of the brain. Can you please describe what the frontal lobes of the brain do for us? Certainly. So the frontal lobes um, are responsible for much of what you think of in terms of personhood, uh, problem solving, spontaneity, memory, language, motivation, judgment, uh, impulse control, higher expressions of social and sexual behavior. So those are all emanating out of this command and control center that's among the last to come online. Doctor, can you please describe the fourth major change with brain development across the teens and into the early mid-20s? So the fourth aspect of, of brain development is an increase, in connect, an increase in connections 
between the different layers of the brain, between the cortex of the brain and deeper emotional uh, uh, levels. Uh, and this is important in regulating emotions. Uh, so, for example, uh, you're not surprised when you see a two-year-old have or two or three-year-old have meltdowns and tantrums and throw themselves on the floor. To pretty easy events. I mean, either it's been, they, they're they're a little bit late on getting a nap, or they it's been a little late since they ate, or they're just frustrated with something, and they have such limited control that they th they just fall to the floor and have a fit. Now, if you saw somebody who was 30 years old do the same thing in the response to the same situation, you'd say, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on with this person? Why don't they have better ability to modulate their emotions as compared to this three-year-old? Well, th that's what this deeper level of connections that has been progressing across childhood does. Uh, as Jeremy is having his meltdowns that his father Dean testified about and that he talked to me about on the phone where the things would build up and he would go into the bathroom and bawl for two or three hours and in the midst of this sobbing be speaking about all of this self-derogatory, I'm such a loser, I'm so stupid, I'm, you know, this, this, this self-recrimination that reflects very inadequately developed, along with depression and some other things that are happening, emotional crisis. It also reflects the, the limited degree of emotional modulation that his cortex is able to provide for him at that time. Doctor, is there a simplification or analogy that summarizes this brain development and the vulnerability that it creates in teens? There is. Uh, m most simply, it's the idea that the gas pedal comes on the gas pedal comes online before the brakes do, um, and that's particularly a vulnerability for middle adolescents, which is like 14 to 17. So, you know, it, it's the concept that if you were going to leave a kid unattended overnight. It might actually be safer to leave an 11-year-old unattended than a 15-year-old because the 11-year-old has 11-year-old impulses but 11-year-old breaks. And the 15-year-old has 15-year-old impulses or maybe even those impulses on steroids and 11-year-old breaks. And so the potential for that kid getting into mischief uh, is actually enhanced. Dr. Cunningham, do these changes in brain physiology and processing have implications for the behavior of teens as opposed to adults? It does. What is the first of these implications? So th the first of these is, is that as they are working with this immature brain, that they are less capable of mature judgments. Uh, and that has several sub-aspects to it. Uh, there's a, a, a tendency, a propensity to engage in risky and even illegal behavior. And that propensity is related to having less mature judgment, which is a direct outgrowth of inadequate physiological support. That's the nature of the brain apparatus that this individual has. Uh, risky and illegal behavior is virtually normative among adolescents virtually normative. Uh, and that risky behavior frequently includes criminal activity. Uh, it is so normative that it is statistically unusual or aberrant to not engage in any criminal activity as an adolescent. But you're kind of an outlier if that's what happens. Uh, both violent crime and less serious offenses peak sharply in adolescence and then drop precipitously in young adulthood. So again, the, this the, the, the criminal behavior is entirely in sync with what's going on with brain development, which is really the foundation of the Miller decision, as the Supreme Court cites all of this brain science. That, that as that, as the functional expressions of that immaturity peak, so does crime. And as that more mature brain comes on board, crime drops off. 
Dr. Cunningham, do you have a chart illustrating recent data regarding this age crime curve? I do. Uh, so this is data that was published just last year, uh, and it's a, a, a graphic that reflects how old the individual is across the bottom. So that ages, ranges from age 10 to 60. And in this chart, all of the increments across that horizontal axis are not the same. So notice that beginning, we go with the first one is a five-year increment from 10 to 15. Then we start taking it year by year, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, out to 25. Then we go to five-year increments again. Well, that allows us to see in much finer detail the curve that's happening between the ages of 15 and 25. The vertical axis, that's the rate of violent crime per 100,000 persons. So this is violent crime we're talking about. Uh, on on the at least the purple, the, the purple graphing is violent crime. The dotted red, the dotted green line is property crime. And notice that those are peaking between the ages of about 15 and 19, both the property crime and the violent crime. And notice that by the time that individual, that by the time we're looking at a population that's 25 or more, their incidence of violent crime is less than half of what it is among individuals that are age 17, for example. And so you see this, uh, this, this crime-related curve that is happening inversely to what's going on in the brain. As the brain is getting more mature, crime is dropping off. Doctor, is this same finding demonstrated with historical data? It is. Uh, so on the left, you see a, a similar graphic where there's age across the bottom axis and criminal activity uh, up the vertical axis. This is data from England and Wales in the 1840s. And you're seeing the same thing. 180 years ago in another country, they're looking at the same thing, that, that, that crime peaks here in the mid to late, across the mid to uh, late teens, and then falls precipitously across the lifespan. Now this looks like a steeper curve because they haven't given year by year for 15, 16, 17, 18. So that pushes the, that, that shrinks this. If you spread this out, it would look just like the current data. Uh, the, the data on the right is U.S. Justice Department data, uh, arrest records in the United States in the 1970s. So we're looking at the same thing historically because human brains are maturing in the same way across these centuries. Dr. Cunningham, when you say that teens are less capable of mature judgments, how would you disaggregate this immaturity? What components does this have? So yeah, you could break this down as we think about less capable mature judgments uh, into being less capable to exercise self-regulation, which means that they're less able to resist their social and emotional impulses. They have less ability there. They use a risk reward calculus that emphasizes the rewards of this over the risk and neglects long-term consequences in favor of immediate rewards. So, Shaden Miller has a very temporary problem of failing Spanish uh, that he is attempting to address. And there's an immediate reward that would come from not failing Spanish after all, with the neglect of the profound cost of this for himself, for Ms. Graber, for Jeremy, for the community as a whole. And so it's this, it, it's a calculus that, negle that neglects that extraordinary cost. And so they have less ability to foresee and take into account the consequences of their behavior or to take into account the perspectives of someone else to appreciate that person's personhood. Doctor, can you provide the court with some examples of this reduced capability in the behaviors of Jeremy in this offense? Um, so the, the, there are so many. So um, 
So consistent with the testimony this morning from the, uh, from the detective, that the planning of this was the planning for how to carry it out. That's what the planning was for. And, and once that tragic act had been carried out, it's like now they're improvising about now what do we do? That the planning of this over that two weeks had not actually gone more than a few minutes beyond the offense. So they didn't think about uh, that the ground was going to be too hard um, or that, uh, that there might be a problem with confessing to some other people that you have done this in terms of, of them not being uh, uh, prosecuted. Um, th so there's this there's this improvisation that's occurring after the fact uh, that neglects uh, the the extraordinary cost that it has. Jeremy's proceeding in, in this offense out of loyalty to a friend and to maintain that friend's approval and be seen positively in Chayden's eyes. So that small social reward for this enormous cost uh, to Ms. Graber and to him and, and Chayden, and, and again, and to so many others that, are, that, are, that have been impacted by the reverberations of this. And so it's, it's a failure to give weight to these costs uh, as if they're not even on the screen. Doctor, in your response, you indicated um, that uh, there was essentially two weeks that uh, Chayden and Jeremy were planning this out. From your perspective as a uh, psychologist, is, is that accurate? Was there two, two weeks of planning that, that these two had engaged in? Well, t two corrections that I would make with that. First, that largely Jeremy seems to have outsourced the planning to Chayden. Uh, as if somehow, since he's there to assist, he doesn't actually have to be engaged in thinking this through, even though his, his own life is profoundly in jeopardy. Uh, as best I can tell from this plan, this is more like 15 minutes of planning that occurs recurrently over a two-week period of time. And that planning is only about how to do it, not about how to get away with it. Now, the, the challenge in a murder is never to carry it out. Uh, that, that's a relatively, it, it, it's a profoundly serious thing, but it's a relatively simple thing to kill somebody. The problem is to do that and not be apprehended for it. That's the challenge. And so a, a, a plan that only carries you through carrying this out but doesn't extend through how you actually avoid apprehension in a significant way, uh, is an example of this, uh, is an adolescent, of adole it's an example of an adolescent approach. It's, if I give an, an analogy, it's like you spend two weeks planning to run away as a teenager. And that involves securing your parent's car and getting it down the street. And you and your girlfriend spend two weeks talking about how each of you, she's going to, you're, you're going to, how you're going to get your parents' car and you're going to go by and get her and she's going to crawl out her window and go down the street. And so there's a plan for how we're going to run away together that only goes as far as getting about a mile down the road. That doesn't then involve, so how will we live? Uh, will we ever see our parents again? Uh, Will we even still like each other in six months since we're only 15 years old now or 16 years old? And so it's a plan that's elaborate up to carrying it out to get to driving away, but that's as far as the plan goes. That's a classically adolescent plan. Dr. Cunningham, what's the next major implication of brain immaturity at age 16? Uh, so the, the next is that, that out of that brain immaturity, adolescents are more vulnerable to negative external influences. 
And so they are much more susceptible than adults are to the influences of neighborhood or family, or as in this case, their peers. Uh, and, and because they are socially dependent, and Jeremy, out of his own self-esteem, vulnerabilities, and his mom's abandonment and other deprivations that I'll talk about, Jeremy is unusually socially dependent uh, as a teenager. And that makes it difficult for them to extract themselves out of a corruptive situation or even out of a plan like this, where once he said yes, extracting himself from this would require some degree of ego uh, strength and autonomy and independence, which he is sorely lacking. And so uh, the other thing that happens from a simply physiological standpoint is that, uh, that even beyond this social dependence, that a teenager's brain actually percolates, processes information differently depending on whether another teen is present. So for example, they do, uh, uh, they, in, in, the, in the lab, they would uh, do functional imaging like a PET scan where you're measuring brain metabolism as somebody is actively thinking about a task. And so you're doing that and one area of the teenager's brain lights up as they're working on a task. You bring another teenager into the room and a di different areas of their brain start lighting up trying to process the same task. Now with adults, when you do that same thing with adults and an area of their brain lights up, you bring in adults or children, they keep using the same part of their brain. It's not affected by it. Uh, but teenagers actually are activating their brain differently depending on just the presence of somebody. They don't have to be coercing them, just their presence. So we have some public policy expression of this in some states uh, a 16-year-old driver is not allowed to drive at night with another teenager in the car unless there's an adult in the front seat. So that's a recognition that this other teenager doesn't have to be directly coercive. Just their being there causes this kid to, to act and think, actually think differently. Dr. Cunningham, uh, can you again please provide some examples of this reduced capability in the behaviors that you observed in this offense? Uh, so as we look at this, this uh, uh, so being subject to influence, um, so th this is an offense that by my analysis, neither Jeremy nor Chayden could have carried out independently. They needed the borrowed ego strength of another kid to be there. So Jeremy tries to recruit, I mean, uh, Chayden tries to recruit Dill before he approaches Jeremy. Dill, whose functional maturity and maybe ego strength is a little bit better, says no. Now, Jer Chayden, out of his limited understanding of the magnitude of what he's proposing and his limited theory of mind, his limited ability to be in the heads of somebody else, he doesn't realize that once he's floated this issue to Dill and Dill says no, he can never now go through with it. He can't now go forward to kill Ms. Graber because here's Dill who first thing upon this is likely to then inform law enforcement, gee, Chayden was talking to me about this, but Chayden is not snapping to that. Uh, he, so he's attempting to recruit a Confederate to kind of shore up his own ability without realizing the implications of what he's done as he makes that, uh, uh, that overture. Uh, so that would, that would be one example of, of this participation in it. And, and Jeremy similarly has never been engaged in serious violence before this. I had a fist fight in the jail, but nothing like this. And so it's difficult to imagine that Jeremy is ever in this situation, but for a good friend who's there with him in it, 
and and you get this synergy. Uh, the, the, my father has a saying about this and about what happens is you add another kid to the mix. And that is that one boy is a boy, two boys are half a boy, and three boys are no boy at all. And that's the idea that as you add in additional immature brains, the net quality of judgment is subtracted. Now you may know this from having a latchkey kid, that you the rule is that you're 13 year old can come in the house, but nobody else comes inside. Because if you have another boy come in, the likelihood of misadventure quadruples. And if three boys come in, anything can happen. And so it's this, again, this idea that the net quality of functioning uh, is reduced as you add another boy to the mix. Doctor, are there additional components of this vulnerability to negative external influence? There are. So we could also identify that there is a developmentally based desire for approval. That's normative. That's supposed to happen, that you want the approval of your peers. And then along with that, a fear of rejection. And so, uh, you know, as Jeremy in his proffer says that he didn't want Chayden to view him as a pussy. Some of that is, is this fear of rejection, this fear of being viewed in a negative way. Now remember, Jeremy already is deriding himself and has such seriously flawed self-esteem coming out of the deprivations and abandonment of his childhood that he is ac acutely vulnerable to this notion of being viewed okay. negatively by somebody who's been his friend for a long time. And, and of course, that approval part of it is only a part of it. It's also this experience of having a friend and the, the developmental focus uh, that makes that agenda primary on top of everything else. Uh, because of these dynamics, uh, teenagers are far more likely to commit crimes in groups or in a context where they experience peer pressure as being part of the motivation uh, for it. Uh, one of the things that happens with, uh, with brain development and also the accrual of functional maturity, I, we all develop a social, the social skills to resist uh, those influences, to tolerate some disapproval, uh, to swallow a rejection. Uh, as we would maintain our own view of, uh, of our own interests and our own view of what's the right thing. Uh, doctor, based on the best available research, when is adult brain development achieved? Uh, best available research says that brain development is not achieved until uh, age 25. So as we think about where Jeremy is at age 16, it isn't that he's right up against 18, so he's almost there. No. This started when he was 12 or 13, and it will continue out to him being 25. So the difference between a 25-year-old and a 16-year-old is not nine years of accumulated experience. The 25-year-old has a fundamentally better wired brain than the 16-year-old. What capabilities develop in sync with the brain maturing? Well, the things that we think about as reflecting maturity, good judgment, uh, impulse control, where an idea occurs to us and we say, no, I'm actually not going to do that. Delay of gratification. Uh, you know, Jeremy at 16, he, he, he works part time. Uh, with a construction company his father worked with at, on school breaks, and whatever money he gets, he blows right away. His ability to delay gratification is so limited. Uh, with time, he'll develop an ability to delay, and, and with brain development, he'll develop an ability to delay that gratification, to save up, to think of long-term goals. Uh, appreciation of consequences, uh, empathy, where you authentically identify with and experience the personhood of someone else. That also is related to this development of the frontal lobes. It's not simply 
that lack of empathy that Chayden and Jeremy expressed toward Ms. Graber is not a sign of somehow being fundamentally pathological or, or depraved. It's an indication of immaturity in their brain development that sharply limits the empathy that they can bring to bear. Doctor, uh, what types of research support the finding that brain development continues to the mid-20s? So there are, are six different lines of research uh, that demonstrate brain development continuing out to the mid-20s. Uh, we can look at uh, psychosocial behavior and, and what underlies that. We can look at statistics on who is getting hurt and killed. Uh, we can look at autopsy and, and pathology tissue studies that are done after people die. Uh, there's also neurochemical and pharmacological research. <clears throat> Neuroimaging, we saw some of that on the time lapse, for example, MRIs and CT. And also functional neuroimaging during task performance, things like those PET studies that I talked about a minute ago. Uh, doctor, I want to briefly explore a couple of these arenas of research with you. Let's start with the psychosocial behavioral assessment research. From this body of research, what functional capabilities are continuing to develop to the mid-20s? So you can see these in an array of, of what's emanating out of the growth and capability in the prefrontal cortex, this front part of the brain. And uh, uh, as we look at those, it involves things like uh, uh, considering the future and, make, <clears throat> and making predictions. Like, uh, if I tell my good friend John Burnett all about this, John Burnett is not in the mafia. He is not a hardened criminal. He's just this middle class, regular kid. And upon hearing this, this will be way too much for him to carry. And he's either going to need to talk to another peer about it, or he's going to need to talk to a parent about it. And as he talks about it, this will very likely come back to the attention of law enforcement. So Jeremy's ability to consider the future and make predictions about it that seem obvious to us about what the social chain is of what will happen as you confess to John Burnett or as you are confessing and sending photos to a couple of your gaming friends in another state. This, it's this profound inability for someone who is otherwise intelligent to be able to project into the future. Um, it, the, uh, other things that are a part of this, organizing your thoughts and problem solving, uh, forming strategies and planning, and planning that goes beyond just the act, but then what happens next? Uh, inhibiting inappropriate behavior, uh, considering multiple streams of information at the same time, uh, weighing consequences, uh, modulating intense emotions that would limit those kind of meltdowns that he has in the bathroom every month or two, uh, impulse control, and delaying gratification, these are all different expressions of maturity that are continuing to develop out to age 25 as the frontal lobes are undergoing the developmental processes that I described. Doctor, do other scholars also address psychosocial capabilities that continue to develop as the brain matures during the early to mid 20s? They do. And can you describe these perspectives? So these come out of a, a research project that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, uh, was undertaking, is they looked at what is developing from the late teens out into the mid-20s as the brain matures. And similarly to this other line of research, they're identifying that with that capability is more complex thinking, an appreciation of diverse views, Mutuality and relationship, that means that you have this sense of reciprocal social obligation to everybody else in society, that we're kind of all in this together. 
and we're, you're oriented toward our joint welfare, not just your own, emotional regulation, uh, risk-taking and decision-making, and progressively having these capabilities available to you, uh, even under stress. What is the relationship between brain development continuing into the mid-20s and moral reasoning? Well, the quality of moral reasoning that someone can bring to bear rests on this same, these, some of the same development. So moral reasoning is not just do you know right from wrong. So a seven-year-old could tell you that it's wrong to kill someone. But the moral reasoning that a seven-year-old can engage about that is very, very different than the moral reasoning that a 30-year-old could bring to bear. So this isn't so simple as just didn't you know it was wrong, but instead what's the quality of understanding and moral reasoning that you can bring to bear about that. And the, the subcomponents then that are a part of adult-like moral reasoning are having a moral code or faith that you're operating from and a sense of personal ethics. And then your behavior is guided by empathy that you experience and resonate uh, uh, the, 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 what somebody else will, will feel uh, or experience. And sensitivity to having your antenna out for those experiences. And then a recognition of the personhood of others that this other person is this unique individual who has his or her own uh, history and story and drama and fears and relationships and significance, the, the extraordinary significance of somebody else's life uh, and being able to take the perspective of that person as well. And then being able to consider the magnitude of consequences for yourself and other people and this sense of reciprocal social obligation that I talked about. So as we talk about or think about the ability of adults to do the right thing and to desist from crime, what we're looking at in that curve that we saw, th those are based on more than just intellectual or cognitive recognition of right and wrong and instead are based on these abilities that are on this continuum that are steadily developing from middle childhood out into your mid-twenties. Dr. Cunningham, now I'd like to briefly explore the research utilizing morbidity and mortality data to reflect brain development. Certainly. What large-scale mor morbidity and mortality data demonstrates continued brain development into the mid-20s? So uh, kind of a classic example of this in, of, in terms of large-scale data are driving fatalities. Uh, this graph is like the others you've seen. The, across the bottom are the age of the drivers. The first bar is 15 to 20, then 21 to 24, then 25 to 34, and so on. Uh, and then the vertical axis are the number of drivers that are involved in fatal crashes per 100,000 drivers. So you can see that that rate of driving fatality peaks for the group that are 15 to 20, who have the more immature brains. The group that's 21 to 24, still working on their brain maturity, but as they've advanced in that sum, notice that their fatality rate drops. And then the group that are 25 to 24 only have about 55% of the fatalities of those 15 to 20 year olds and so on down the line until you get out to age uh, 69. Uh, then you get a little bit of an uptick with the uh, impairments of age uh, that occur. But up to that time, you see the, the, the benefits of increasing a maturity and, and particularly you note the difference between 15 to 20 and 25 to 34. Uh, Doctor, what about homicide data? Uh, does this also illuminate brain development considerations? It does. So we see a similar sort of thing in terms of homicide offending. Uh, the homicide offending rate for males age 18 to 24 is 29.3 per 100,000. That rate is double that of persons that are 25 to 34 
where it's 14.9 per 100,000. So not only do you see the effects of brain development and age uh, in driving fatalities, you also see this in terms of crime and even uh, homicides. Dr. Cunningham, uh, to simplify for the court, what is the functional implication of being 16 years old? That you are immature. Uh, you're immature in your brain development and you're immature in the functional capabilities that are an outgrowth of that immature brain development. In addition to findings associated with Jeremy's brain immaturity at age 16, did you also make findings about his functional maturity? I did. I found him to, to exhibit particular functional immaturity. In other words, that he is less functionally, at that, that time was less functionally mature than most 16-year-old age mates. What is the most glaring demonstration of Jeremy's particular functional immaturity? His participation in this offense. Um, I mean, in, in the contrast, an overture is made to Dill he has enough functional maturity to say no. Uh, an overture is made to Jeremy, and he doesn't have it. Um, and, and I think that's part of what is disturbing uh, about his involvement in this. Is my gosh, how could you step in to do this for something that wasn't your agenda, wasn't your problem? Uh, and I think it goes to this particular functional immaturity. Dr. Cunningham, what factors may result in particular immaturity exacerbating the brain immaturity shared by all 16-year-olds? So there are, are four different areas of adversity that may end up affecting functional maturity, the ability to take advantage of at least where you are at age 16. Uh, there can be issues that are a function of the wiring of the brain, neurodevelopmental factors that may result in somebody operating with lower functional maturity than their age mates. Uh, there may be psychosocial adversities. That's what's going on in your family and community and what traumas and deprivations are that are there that are undermining your developmental progress. Then it may be that there are psychological disorders that may be present. Those psychological disorders also act to reduce the functional maturity that you can bring to bear. And finally, there may be substance abuse. Uh, substance abuse that acts to undermine the development of coping capabilities and uh, uh, psychological health. Uh, doctor, and, and you may have included this in your explanation, um, but I'll just go ahead and ask, uh, and it, just let me know if, if you've already answered the question. The first arena of maturity delaying factors, neurodevelopmental deficits, what, what is that? Well, that's, that's anything having to do with the wiring that you have. Uh, that could be attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, such as Jeremy exhibited. It could be learning disabilities. Uh, it could be uh, a deficient intelligence. Uh, it could be uh, neurologically adverse events like huffing glue or paint or anoxias that have occurred for one reason or another. It's anything that that negatively impacts the wiring of the brain. Dr. Cunningham, were such neurodevelopmental deficits in Jeremy addressed in your next finding? They are. What was that? My second finding is Jeremy's functional maturity was delayed by untreated attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Does your discussion on this finding begin on page 19 of your report? It does. Dr. Cunningham, what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? So uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a disorder that's made up of a triad of symptoms. Uh, inattention, difficulty focusing, distractibility, inattention. Impulsivity, uh, that's acting with insufficient forethought. <laughs> and excessive motor activity, that's being hyper, that the kid seems to always be on the go. Now, these are all thought to be related to a common process which is uh, uh, an, an adequate activation of inhibitory neurons. The inhibitory neurons are the ones that would put the brakes on your nervous system, on your brain. Uh, and because those inhibitory circuits are not functioning adequately, 
the child is less able to focus his attention because, you know, something happens over here, kind of squirrel, and so he's then diverted because he can't inhibit that to focus on this. The same thing with responding to impulses of not putting the brakes on those. Uh, and even the excessive motor activity is about those inhibitory neurons not slowing down the circuits. Uh, doctor, does the presence of ADHD place a child generally at greater risk for other disorders? It does. Can you explain that for us? So this is a, based on large scale data over 61,000 children, including 5,000 with ADHD. And we're examining comorbidity. Comorbidity means one disorder is there with another one. Uh, and four different categories were examined in this study. And we've got the kids with ADHD and the kids with no ADHD. So for learning disability, the, the kids with ADHD were nine times more likely to have a learning disability. 46% versus 5% they were 13 times more likely to have conduct disorder. That's a pattern of more serious behavior disturbance in childhood. They were nine times more likely to have anxiety, and they were 14 times more likely to suffer from depression. Now, they didn't all suffer from depression. Only one in seven suffered from depression. But see, that's 14 times the rate of depression among the kids that don't have ADHD. Uh, often there was more than one, one disorder present. So 33% of the kids uh, had one additional comorbid disorder, 16% had two, 18% had three or more. Doctor, did Jeremy exhibit any of these comorbid disorders? He did. And which ones? Uh, anxiety and depression. What childhood behavior issues are associated with ADHD? Uh, so, the, the, again, from the same study, uh, the kids with ADHD were four times more likely to be placed on activity restrictions, five times more likely to have school problems, uh, and were more often observed to repeat a grade, have poor parent-child communication, and lower social competence. Dr. Cunningham, were any of these increased risks realized in Jeremy's childhood? They were. Which ones? Uh, so his father has him on chronic activity uh, restriction, and he's getting in trouble at school uh, periodically. Uh, there is poor parent-child communication between Jeremy and Dean, and his social competence is lower, particularly in terms of his low self-esteem around that and his social anxiety. As he's observed from the outside, other kids don't seem to see him as being socially incompetent, but his experience of, of that himself is of being socially incompetent, and that then interferes with uh, his ability to relate. Doctor, is there a symptom of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder that is particularly implicated in this offense? There is. And what is that? That's impulsivity. As we consider the role of planning in Jeremy's behavior in this offense and whether this was impulsive, what considerations are important to bring to bear? So it's critically important to understand that there are two types of impulsivity. There is reactive impulsivity and judgment impulsivity. Now, reactive impulsivity is an immediate response to provocation, opportunity, or urge. Uh, somebody bumps into you and you shovel. Uh, so that's spontaneous with little planning or preparation. And that reactive impulsivity is most characteristic of preschool age children or adults who are angry or intoxicated or are suddenly confronted with a situation that they didn't expect and now are reacting to it. That's reactive impulsivity. Uh, that's not the type of impulsivity, though, that's most common with teenagers or among kids with ADHD. Their impulsivity is more likely to reflect judgment impulsivity. So judgment impulsivity is like, uh, I meet a woman today, and we spend the next two days planning our lives together, and on Wednesday we get married. Now that's profoundly impulsive, even though we spent the last two days 
talking and thinking and planning for it. That's judgment impulsivity. So there's planning, but it's ill-conceived with an inadequate weighing of consequences and very often a curtailed future projection. It's like the projection is only as far as we get married and we ride off into the sunset or uh, we get down the road in the car or in this instance, okay, now tragically Ms. Graber is, is down. Okay, now what? That's that curtailed future projection. Dr. Cunningham, later in your testimony, uh, will you be detailing illustrations of judgment, impulsivity in the offense planning and conduct in this case? I will, and, and those are, are numerous. What was the next arena of maturity delayed, delaying factors in Jeremy's childhood that exacerbated the brain immaturity shared by all 16-year-olds? So the next factor is psychosocial adversities. What categories of psychosocial adversity did you find in Jeremy's background? So I found three of those. There are family dysfunctions and deprivations. And then there are social divisions in school and community. And then third, there's the pandemic. Let's begin with the first of these psychosocial adversities, uh, family dysfunctions and deprivations. Which of your findings addresses this psychosocial adversity? So this is finding three. Jeremy Goodale's childhood was characterized by chronic family dysfunctions and deprivations, acting to delay age expected autonomy, ego strength, and functional maturity. Does this, uh, does your discussion of this finding begin on page 21 of your report? It does. Dr. Cunningham, please list what you've learned about the family dysfunctions and deprivations in Jeremy's background. I seem to have lost the screen that I have. There it is. Um, so I identified nine of these. Uh, I identified that there is transgenerational family dysfunction and distress. That's family dysfunction that goes from generation to generation. Uh, there was his mother's increasing failure to foster emotional autonomy with each successive child that she had. That being the worst with Jeremy, who was the last of the five children. There was his mother's emotional detachment from and neglect of her children when they were no longer babies. It's characterized to me that it's like the child was a baby doll. And after the child wasn't a baby doll anymore, then she was done with it. Uh, there was broader parental neglect in addition to these features. There was the parents' excessive work hours, and the, not just their hours, but their focus on work and, and a, and a, that was given primacy to the detriment of the kids. Uh, parental care and nurturance was abdicated to Jackie, uh, as she testified. There was chronic marital dysfunction. Uh, between Jean, Dean and Christine, that was then followed by separation and divorce. Uh, Christine then abandoned her children for Jeff Griggs, her boyfriend. And then there were Dean's interpersonal limitations and his attitudinal rigidity. And those were all synergistically interacting dysfunctions and deprivations that were undermining Jeremy's development. Dr. Cunningham, your first factor is transgenerational dysfunction and distress. What's the relevance of the relatives in Jeremy's family system to his decisions and outcomes? Well, there are several processes by which generations influence each other. Uh, very importantly, the child is predisposed through heredity. Um, so the likelihood of substance abuse and dependence has a very significant hereditary element to it, uh, even if you're adopted at birth. Similarly, uh, the likelihood of mood disorder, anxiety disorder also has a significant hereditary component. Even personality traits have significant hereditary aspects to them. Now, Again, these things are not based on your interactions with these people. This is what you're getting genetically. It's like your risk of heart disease or high blood pressure 
or some forms of cancer. It's not about your interactions, it's about what's happening at a cellular level that you have inherited. And so that's, that's a major way that generations impact each other is through heredity. Uh, then there are some other mechanisms that are, that are based on what's happening uh, uh, psychosocially in a family. The first of these is scripts. Scripts are the unwritten story of how your life is supposed to go. And that story is based on, that self-created story is based on your observations of your parents and siblings and stories about your grandparents or extended family, to some extent perhaps on the community around you. Uh, and, and on the basis of that, a script for your life is developed. So for example, in my clinical practice, I've had a 16-year-old girl who, in front of me who was pregnant and unmarried, whose mother was pregnant and unmarried at 15, whose mother was pregnant and unmarried at age 15. Well, there's more going on here than just this little girl's decisions in the backseat of a car. This is a script about how your life is supposed to go. Now, those scripts may either be positive or negative, depending on kind of what the raw materials are. Um, so, I, for example, I have uh, interviewed a school teacher in the inner city on a case that happened there, and she was talking about sitting her class in small groups where there was a discussion about what they wanted to be when they grew up. And some of the little boys would say, when I go to prison, because everybody in their life has gone to prison. This is part of the script of what happens to you. Or alternatively, it never occurred to me not to finish high school. It never really occurred to me not to finish college. That's just kind of what you did. And so those scripts may be f functional or they may carry someone in harm's way. Then the, another multi-generational process is modeling. Uh, modeling is where you catch yourself doing the thing your parent did that you swore you never would. So that's imitation whether you wanted to or not. And that modeling may be based on what you see your parents doing or sibling, or, or it could be your siblings and what you observe from them. Uh, and then there's a third uh, process called sequential damage. Sequential damage means that Christine was damaged as she was growing up by an alcoholic father, by the divorce of her parents, by being tasked with raising her own younger siblings. Christine was damaged by her own developmental experiences. She becomes an adult and begins to have children, but she is a damaged person. And so she loves her children, but she loves them badly. And she damages the next generation. Dean is damaged by the alcoholism of both of his parents, by their chronic conflict, by their domestic violence, by his father's womanizing and even involving him as, as a subterfuge for pursuing that. Dean is damaged by that and by, I think, some hereditary uh, interpersonal disfluency that is in his family system. And so as he goes about parenting as well, he comes into that being a damaged person. And he loves his children, but it's, it's in the face of those impairments that limit him. Uh, so that, that's this notion of sequential damage. Uh, doctor, as we talk about this first factor, transgenerational dysfunction and distress in Jeremy's family system, have you prepared a family tree to assist the court's understanding? I have. Can you share that with us now? Certainly. Uh, so on this family tree, the females are ovals and the males are squares, are rectangles. Uh, everybody that has a genetic relationship with Jeremy has a solid line around their shape. If there's a dotted line, that means they're part of the family system, but there's no hereditary relationship. And so at the top, we have, we have the paternal family on the left and the maternal family on the right. The very first level are the grandparents. So you have Richard and June Goodale, Dean's parents, Jeremy's grandparents. They're married to each other and they have four children. 
Richard is subsequently married twice. And June is married once. So that's not the grandparents' level. Then on the maternal side, the maternal grandparents are Bernard and Heidi Boyer. They have two children of their own, Christine and Eric. Then Bernard is with Yolanda and has two children with her. And Heidi is with Sylvan and has two children with him. Then we're pulling Christine down with a dotted line so that she is then married to Dean. And they have five children. Then she ultimately has another uh, uh, common law, at least, a partner, Jeff Griggs. Uh, and then the dates of birth, of the, uh, the years of birth, uh, are also reflected. Uh, Dean is the, the third of four boys. Uh, he is 11 years older than Christine as they get together. And then Jackie's born in 95, Camille in 96, Sophia in 98, Olivia in 2001, Jeremy in 2005. So that's kind of our family system as we would map it uh, in a family tree or, or what psychologists call a, a genogram. Uh, doctor, using this family tree, can you please describe some of the transgenerational dysfunction and distress in Jeremy's family system? I can. So first, the shapes that are shaded in gray, I just don't have information about. So I don't know what their outcomes are. So that's why they're shaded in gray. Everybody who is shaded in in yellow has a history of drug or alcohol abuse. Uh, now, that's important because the most powerful risk factor for drug and alcohol abuse is heredity. And so, as Jeremy has a significant marijuana dependency, then the presence of alcohol and drug abuse in his family background becomes really important to understand how he came by that and what his own choices have to do with it. Now. The presence of alcohol or drug abuse doesn't just affect the likelihood of that outcome, it also increases the likelihood of mood disorder. So these two things are cross, uh, uh, they're linked with each other, where either substance dependence or mood disorder increases the likelihood of either one among family members. All right, so everybody who is in yellow has a history of drug and alcohol abuse. Everybody with a heavy red line around their shape has a history of mood disorder. So that includes the paternal grandmother and Christine and two sisters and Jeremy. Everybody with a heavy blue line around their shape has a history of interpersonal disfluency. And that includes Richard... Uh, Goodale, the paternal grandfather, Neil, the paternal uncle, and Dean. Those that have the dotted uh, uh, field in their shape have a history of criminal activity in their youth. And so that's two paternal uncles, Dean and Jeremy. And then those that have the circle with the line through it, that reflects dropping out of high school. And that includes Christine, Jackie, Camille, and Sophia. Dr. Cunningham, you, you have specified mood disorders, substance dependence, and interpersonal disfluency on the family tree. What is the significance of this in Jeremy's family system? Well, those all then increase the risk of his having those same issues. So remember that uh, alcohol and, and drug abuse and mood disorder share this Cross genetic vulnerability that involves one of the other involves a lot of shapes in Jeremy's family system. There is significant loading for him to have both substance issues and mood disorder, given the loading that this has uh, in his family system. And interpersonal disfluency also has a hereditary uh, aspect to it. Uh, and some of Jeremy's social anxiety and lack of confidence and that sort of thing, as well as even his navigating of this situation reflects some social disfluency. Doctor, uh, are there broad scientific findings that support the role of uh, 
heredity in substance dependence, mood disorders, and psychological disorders, and even personality characteristics? There are. From your analysis of the family deprivations Jeremy experienced, how would you explain the parenting dysfunctions of Christine? So yeah, so it's kind of an overview. We've listed out here are the deprivations and that, that Jeremy experienced. How do we understand how these occurred uh, in his family of origin? And we'll begin with Christine. Um, so Christine exhibits a, a broad parenting disfluency. It's as if she doesn't really understand how you go about the process of raising uh, an emotionally healthy child, how you go about equipping this child to leave you someday and optimally go out into the world as a healthy, functional person. She seems not to have much of a clue about exactly what, what that involves. Um, uh, her approach to parenting is egocentric. That means that she experiences it in terms of herself. So that's this notion that her children are objects. And as long as that little object is gratifying to her needs, then she's on board with it. But as that object is no longer meeting her needs, or as it, 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 there's even some tension or inconvenience or it interferes with a relationship, then she jettisons that. Um, Instead, her own dependency needs are primary. What makes her feel significant and cared for as opposed to what will help this child feel significant and cared for. And then she's also prone to depression. Uh, and out of that, uh, there is an abdication of care to Jackie, for example, and, other, and the other older sisters. Uh, there's a general disinterest in the child and the child's activities and creating a sense of ongoing significance for the kid uh, and abandonment. Uh, you know, the abandonment is, uh, is grossest for Jeremy, who's abandoned at age 10. But she actually abandons all of her children. Uh, the, her relationship with the girls largely ended as she was expelling them from the house as teenagers. Uh, and even as they have reached out to her uh, in young adulthood, she has not responded uh, by restoring that relationship. So that's ultimately the, the most profound injury that's done to Jeremy's childhood is that abandonment that she broadly then exhibited to the family system as a whole. Doctor, earlier we had heard testimony from Jackie describing the incident in which her mother kicked her out of the house during her teenage years. Uh, is that an example of Christine uh, sort of weighing her dependency needs and making a choice? And can you elaborate on that? Sure. So, uh, so Jackie described uh, Christine going back and forth between Jeff, who's in the car, and Jackie. And as she goes back and forth, trying to figure out how is she going to negotiate the supports for her. So Jackie, at this point, has essentially become her mom's friend and confidant. They work together in the restaurant. They sit and smoke cigarettes and drink together. Uh, Jackie is the primary parent, not just a co-parent, but kind of the primary parent uh, for Jeremy. And so... Christine is significantly relying on Jackie as a source of support for her. She's letting Jackie drop out of school to help her in the restaurant, not what is it that best serves Jackie's future. And so here's Christine who's caught between her dependency needs. She's got Jeff over here and she's got Jackie over here and she's going back and forth and ultimately she resolves that her dependency needs are best met by kicking Jackie out and having Jeff. Uh, and so that's, that story kind of captures her dependency vulnerability and, uh, uh, and her resolution of that at, at great cost to uh, Sophia, who she's gotten fired and she's kicking out, Jackie, who's living in a car, uh, Jeremy, uh, who loses his primary mother figure in that household. 
uh, and then ultimately she expels Jeremy by leaving herself. Dr. Cunningham, <clears throat> what about Dean? How would you explain the parent parenting dysfunctions uh, you found exhibited by Dean? Uh, so Dean also exhibits uh, significant parenting disfluency, even though he's well-intended. Um, Jackie characterized that her father was better with plants than he was with people. Uh, that there's something about the process of relationship that he doesn't entirely get. Um, and he's also egocentric in a different sort of way than Christine, where Christine was egocentric oriented around her dependency needs. Dean is egocentric about his ideas, about his ideology, about what he thinks, what his ideas about uh, the smart thing to do, what other people should do, the vaccine, schooling, food, politics, woke, transgender. I mean, he, th these ideas that he has within his own head end up being more important than, than the relationships of engaging, uh, uh, which he has had great difficulty doing with his children uh, and is uh, semi-estranged uh, from uh, several of his daughters. Uh, or, or they've agreed not to discuss anything except a, a narrow range of, uh, of topics. Uh, and then Dean was heavily oriented toward his work uh, and, uh, and was a hard worker, but heavily oriented toward that work and toward contributing to this kind of food aspect of the uh, Maharishi movement. Uh, you get a sense of, of Dean's parenting uh, in his response to seeking treatment for Jeremy that he testified about to today. Uh, so, as, as I understand Dean's kind of orientation toward psychological and physical health, so you need to be physically and spiritually centered by meditating, and then you need to keep your body well integrated with all of that by eating properly, eating organic foods and avoiding vaccines and medicines and that kind of thing. And that's what will make you happy. That's what will create the attending to those things will result in everything being good. So he takes Jeremy to a functional medicine specialist. So Jeremy is devastated by the abandonment of his mother and by the other neglect that I'll talk about. He desperately needs someone to talk to to relate to, uh, to give him some sense of connection as he is just lost as a goose as an early adolescent with all, carrying all of this history. And Dean takes him to a provider whose primary focus is gonna be on getting his body balanced. And where the consultation with the psychologist is a part of it, but it's like once a month. Now, you know, admittedly even that didn't happen. Uh, but it's as if Dean doesn't actually have a, a good grasp of what it is that's happening to somebody who's hurting and how do you relate to them about that. Um, and so as a result, uh, he ends up being emotionally detached. He's plugged in on prescribing what you need to be doing or what you need to do to fix this, or what the ideals are, uh, but he's detached from actually relating. Uh, Jeremy described that there was a period of time where they went camping some, and then that stopped. It's like then it was, it, that, that, that wasn't sustained. Um, he was also unreliable out of his work focus. So Jeremy uh, is supposed to be picked up from the Maharishi school, and he's still there waiting for his dad after all the other kids have been picked up, and even all the teachers have gone home except one, who's not allowed to leave while a student is still here. 
So the school talks to Dean about that. You really need to get here to pick him up. Uh, and it still happens after that. Eventually, the teacher, the last teacher just says, so Jeremy, is your dad coming? Yeah, I think he'll be here. Okay, see you. So there's an unreliability aspect. Even as Dean talked about securing counseling services for Jeremy across a, a three or four year period of time, but actually we had to be talking about a five year period of time. That needed to start when mom left when he was 10, out to age 16. That's, that's six years of risk. Jeremy's having these meltdowns along the way at you know, 13, 14, 15. And I, I heard him describe some attempts that were made, but not actually making it happen going to the counseling center and making that happen, securing those resources. Um, and then uh, it also has been characterized by estrangement. Uh, Jeremy and Dean were estranged within the household because Jeremy was unable to structure himself and their relationship turned increasingly punitive. Uh, and then Dean has been somewhat estranged from uh, his daughters as well, the closest now to Jackie. Uh, but has some degree of estrangement with the others. Dr. Cunningham, several of the parenting dysfunctions you've identified involve parental neglect. What different forms of parental neglect did you identify in Jeremy's childhood? So there was neglect of autonomy, of helping create somebody who could be a portable person with ego strength and the ability to say no and to recognize himself as being separate. There was neglect of nurturance. There was household neglect, just in the general conditions of the household. There was hygiene neglect on making sure that Jeremy got a bath regularly and put on clean clothes. There was neglect of structure, uh, even things as simple as like getting picked up from school. There was neglect of social engagement. Uh, uh, they lived six miles out of town. Jeremy might have a friend come home from school once or twice a month. But there was not a sense of the importance in childhood of routine interaction outside of school with your peers and having a best friend and what that does in development. Uh, similarly, he, he played a little bit of sports. He did a season or two of Little League and a you know, season of soccer over here. Uh, his Little League experience was unsuccessful because he was always afraid of the ball because nobody had played catch with him enough for him to get the skill of not being afraid of a fly ball descending on him and hitting him in the face. Um, there was neglect of medical care, neglect of mental health care, and a neglect of emotional support. So there are many different types of neglect that he, that he suffered. Dr. Cunningham, you specified neglect in fostering autonomy. Please describe the role of fostering autonomy in effective parenting. Sure. So the, uh, the job as a parent is to work yourself out of the job. So you are increasingly equipping this child and helping them grow the muscles to take care of themselves uh, and are titrating kind of what you provide uh, in the service of helping them steadily gain uh, independence and also making sure that they are absorbing enough love and support that they actually have those inner resources inside. Um, and that, that, that aspect of fostering effective autonomy uh, was one that was, uh, that was negatively impacted in some pretty primary ways early in Jeremy's childhood and, and in fact continuing on uh, out into his adolescence nearly. What happens when autonomy is not fostered or supported in childhood? Um, then you have someone whose uh, ability to stand on his own feet or not at an age appropriate level. Um, his ability to uh, exercise boundaries about what's his problem and what's not, um, about saying no to things that are going to be destructive. Uh, so part of what happens with insufficient autonomy is something like this offense. 
Dr. Cunningham, what was the first way that Christine, Jeremy's mother, undermined her children's autonomy and how this fit into her parent parenting uh, dysfunctions? And so uh, one of the first expressions of autonomy in childhood is feeding yourself. And you'll see kids trying to demonstrate this when they're, you know, even a year or so old, at some point they start trying to take the spoon out of your hand and say, me do it. And so as you equip them to feed themselves, that's an early practice in the development of autonomy. So Christine, by contrast, as we think about this very early fundamental way that autonomy is encouraged in a child, Christine was continuously breastfeeding for 15 years. It's this baby doll notion. So she nurses Jackie for a year until we have Camille. Then nurses Camille for two years until we got Sophia. Then nurses breastfeeds Sophia two and a half to three years until we got Olivia. Then breastfeeds Olivia for over four years till we have Jeremy. Jeremy is still being breastfed at age four to five. Now, you might say, well, isn't this evidence that she is just really tied in to nurturing these kids? How can you talk about neglect? Well, because of what she does after they're not a baby and she's not nursing them anymore. Well, then there's a general disinterest. Uh, in the child. And so this is an expression of Christine's dependency needs, uh, that she is significant as she keeps her baby doll. Um, so this is a, 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 a very early kind of primary autonomy eroding uh, family behavior. Uh, parenting, mothering behavior that's occurring here. Can you explain how weaning a child helps foster autonomy for a child? Well, sure, because now they're, they are putting food in their own, the, the child is putting food in his own mouth. He's not getting it from his mother's body. He has that much separation from her. I'm here and I feed myself and you're here and you feed yourself and that is no longer something that is fundamentally in common where I'm dependent on you. So that's an early expression of, of autonomy. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, was there another way that Jeremy's parents failed to foster developmental, developmentally appropriate autonomy? There was. And what was that other arena? That was co-sleeping. So Christine's pattern was that until the child was weaned, that child would share the marital bed, be in bed with her and Dean. Now, Jeremy then was sleeping with his parents until the separation, until he's five years old. Then after the separation, when he's with Dean for that week, he's in Dean's bed nightly until he's seven or eight, and then about half the nights on out to age nine or ten. With Christine, he's sharing her bed until he's ten years old, until she leaves him. Now at times, he slept on a futon in Christine's room. There was also a period of time where they moved to a house where he slept in a bunk bed, I think with, an, with another sibling in that bunk bed arrangement. Uh, but primarily to age 10, he's sleeping with an adult. Doctor, can you explain the role of child sleeping in his own bed as that helps foster autonomy? Uh, so one of the things that happens is the child is in, in his own bed is that then he has to deal with his own fears. He has to soothe himself from uh, uh, his anxiety. Um, uh, he has to manage uh, his own experience separate from the parent. And that, uh, as that is exercised on a nightly basis, the child is developing the capabilities to be an independent being, 
to tolerate some discomfort, to soothe themselves. That's, that's one of the experiences that is, uh, that's providing that. Uh, when that doesn't happen, then when the child doesn't have those experiences, then those autonomy muscles don't grow. Uh, when I was primarily in clinical practice, I would periodically treat a child with school phobia who was terrified to go to school for fear something would happen to the parents while they were at school and was refusing to go. I might even be talking about running in front of a car if you make me go to school. As I took a history in those families, invariably the child was sleeping with an adult. They were sleeping with their parents or they were sleeping with grandma. And, and that was a factor that was feeding them the degree of insecurity in those cases that drove that school phobia. Doctor, I think we discussed this a few minutes ago, but how were deficits in autonomy reflected in Jeremy's participation in this offense? Uh, so uh, this is not Jeremy's problem. Chaden is failing Spanish, not Jeremy. Chaden may be impacted on going to an exchange program, not Jeremy. So this is not Jeremy's problem, it's Chaden's problem. Well, that's a boundary issue about who does this belong to. Uh, then that, that Jeremy is so dependent on a friendship with Chaden that he can't tolerate being separated from him on this agenda, lest Chaden disapprove of him in some way. That's a boundary issue, an autonomy uh, related issue. Um, he outsources the planning to Chaden. Wait, Jeremy, your whole life is in the balance here. This is about you and your life and your outcome. You can't outsource this to somebody else like it's not yours. Uh, so that's an autonomy uh, related issue. Uh, subsequently, Chaden has Jeremy uh, push the, uh, the tarp in the wheelbarrow across town in the middle of the night which is certainly going to be memorable to anybody who happens to observe that. So Chaden isn't pushing the wheelbarrow on the tarp. He has Jeremy doing that. Well, Jeremy doesn't have enough theory of mind to be questioning, so how come I'm the one who's doing this? And then he doesn't have enough autonomy to say, wait, I'm getting loaded up with this responsibility. Uh, then even as Jeremy is talking about this, uh, to peers, uh, both uh, making a statement to Zoe in advance of the offense, would you still care about me if I killed somebody, uh, then uh, informing John Burnett all about it, and then his two gaming friends, even that compulsion to talk about this reflects an adequate autonomy of being able to hold this within himself just not enough sense of autonomy and boundaries, even to hold his own story without compulsively needing to tell other people about it. Uh, doctor, did you observe any deficits in Jeremy's autonomy uh, reflected in his behavior following the events? Well, that's what I just described about his, his telling people about it. Uh, 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 that, um, again, that he couldn't, well, well both Chayden uh, involving him in a major way in the uh, after action um, behaviors, and then also his compulsively having to share it with other people. Does Jeremy continue to uh, be delayed in developing age appropriate autonomy? And uh, if you. If you believe so, can you provide an example of that? Sure. So, uh, so being arrested would not be expected to somehow fix Jeremy's immaturity. There's nothing about being arrested that would suddenly advance you from 16 going on 14 to 16 going on 30. So we're going to kind of, we would kind of expect to see that he is still immature and that he still has issues with autonomy, that that's going to be a vulnerable spot. 
Uh, and in fact, there is a uh, uh, there is an instance in the jail that happens where there is an inmate who's put in with them who is not bathing and who is being disrespectful in other ways, allowing his pants to sag so that his genitals are exposed at times and then you know smells really bad because he's not bathing. And, and this inmate has been moved from one spot in the jail to another as inmates complain about him. Uh, and so the staff then moves him to another section of the jail. Uh, this is a typical kind of inmate situation where inmates will advise staff, if you don't move this person, they're going to get hurt. So then they'll move him to someplace else. Well, they move him around. Finally, they put this guy in the small area that Jeremy and a few other uh, uh, inmates are in. And his guy's still doing the same things. And Jeremy asks the staff to address it, asks them to move him, speaks to him about it several times, uh, and nothing happens. Asks the guy to take a bath, and uh, the, the guy's unresponsive, the inmate's unresponsive to that. Uh, so there is an older inmate who is talking to Jeremy. It's kind of schooling him about how custody works and prison works. This guy's been to prison before. And that what needs to happen is you got to assault this guy. you got to hit him. And then after you do that, then the staff will move him because you've demonstrated he's going to get hurt. So, and that this is what stand-up inmates do, is they take care of business. Uh, Jeremy ends up then taking that on. Even though his own sentencing case is only three, four, five months away, even though there's such jeopardy that he's facing, and even though there are other inmates who could certainly do that instead, Jeremy takes this on. So they decide that they're going to both run out of the cell when this guy's out and begin hitting him. The other guy fades and doesn't do it. Jeremy goes anyway and goes out and punches him. Uh, that's an example of continued immaturity about looking down the road at how this might really go badly for you. Uh, and also that, um, uh, that somebody is talking you into something. Dr. Cunningham, as we continue to illustrate the neglect characterized, characterizing Jeremy's childhood, please provide some examples in the arenas of household and hygiene neglect. Certainly. Uh, so in, in the household, uh, there were mountains of dirty laundry. The kitchen was always infested with flies and bugs. Uh, there were cobwebs in every corner of the room when they were out on the farm. The floor was always dirty. And so the household is in this status of, of neglect. Uh, there was neglect of Jeremy's hygiene as a kid. Uh, until he was an adolescent, he was bathing once or twice a week. Uh, now, it's not the kid's job to decide they need a bath every night when they're five, six, seven, eight years old. That's the parent's job. Uh, and he's only bathing once or twice a week. He is often sleeping in his clothes and then wearing them again the next day. There's neglect of just basic child hygiene. Dr. Cunningham, was there a contributing factor to Christine neglecting the household and to Jeremy's hygiene? I think there is. I mean, you know, part of it is her own egocentric focus, but additionally, she was depressed. Uh, Sophia described, recalled that her mom would have periods where she wouldn't get out of bed uh, uh, to help with what well, she would get out of bed to help with the livestock, but that's all she would do. Uh, she had a garden, did a farmer's market, but there were days that she just wanted to lay down and be left alone. That's a classic depressed depression presentation. Doctor, can you please illustrate the emotional neglect Jeremy suffered? Uh, so I've, I've already talked about that his practical care and his nurturance was and supervision was abdicated to Jackie. Uh, he got little affection after his preschool years. Uh, there was uh, uh, inconsistent and only partial support for positive peer involvement. He did have some teams that he played on, uh, but not the routine kind of social engagement that a kid needs. Uh, 
Christine infrequently interacted with him, uh, rarely attended one of his games, uh, and I described Dean was chronically late in picking him up from school. Uh, doctor, can you please illustrate the physical and emotional abandonment that Jeremy had suffered? So first, Jackie is amputated uh, from his life as Christine gets involved with Jeff Griggs, and that involvement apparently lasts a couple of years. Uh, and over that period of time, he uh, expels Jackie and uh, Sophia from the household. And, and with that, now Jeremy's primary emotional support person uh, in his sister he has been amputated from his life. Jackie tries to make it up to Christine. She sends her flowers. She writes her notes. She's doing things to see if they can't restore communication both to have a relationship with her mother and also to be able to still be available to Jeremy and Christine rebuffs all those efforts. She's not having it. And again, likely uh, Jeff is a, a, a driving force in that. Uh, then she abandons him for Jeff Griggs when he's 10 years old. Uh, and this very precipitously. Uh, Jeremy remembers that about six months before his mom left, she said something about Fairfield was not a good place to live, and she didn't think she wanted to live there. And then one day she invites him to come over for lunch, and when he gets there, the house is being boxed up. And so he eats lunch with her and Jeff, and then he helps them put things in the boxes and describes that it was pretty surreal about what, what's going on. Um, that was the last time he saw his mother for a year and a half or two years, when he then went for a weekend visit down in Colorado and has never seen her since. Um, so that's what's happening with mom. And then, then Dean is disfluent about emotionally connecting to Jeremy. He creates aspirations for him and, t and, and tells him about what he's supposed to do and why, but has difficulty actually uh, relating to him and talking to him. Um, so the characterization uh, was that nobody talked with Jeremy about his emotional experiences. Dr. Cunningham, how significant is the emotional nurturance from a mother in childhood? So th that emotional nurturance is foundational. That's the foundation that the rest of this person's life and personality uh, will be built on. Can you provide the court with an anecdote to illustrate this? Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of a foundation level kind of thing. Um, so... Uh, in my oldest son's first year of life, he had a lot of ear infections. And those would tend to flare up in the night, and he would awaken from sleep crying as his tubes got stopped up, I guess. And so my wife and I would take turns, two or three hour turns, and would go into the bedroom and pick him up. And if you picked him up and put him on your shoulder, leaned your head over against him, as long as you were up with him and walking, he would stop crying and go back to sleep, but lightly asleep. Because if you just kind of lean back against the dresser, trying to take a little weight off your legs, ah, you know, he starts crying again. So just, by, just hour after hour, walking from one corner of the room to the other, patting him to help him sleep. So then he was about, it wasn't fif about 15 months. He had not been walking very long. And he walked over and he picked up the little stuffed monkey doll off his toy chest and he put it on his shoulder and he cocked his head against it and he, and he started walking from one corner of the room to the other, patting the monkey doll. And I turned to my wife and I said, when he has children who cry in the night and he reacts with nurturance instead of rage, he will have no idea where that comes from. This is where it comes from. 
this is that foundation that nurturance gives you. Uh, that you will later, but he doesn't remember that, you will later draw on that foundation long after the linoleum covers it up and you can't remember it. But that's what you're still drawing against. What happens when a child instead experiences emotional neglect? That has an effect of shattering this foundation and creating fundamental vulnerabilities. Uh, that they will struggle to recover from, that will slow the progression of maturity for them. How does neglect compare to physical abuse in terms of the emotional injury in childhood? So neglect is more damaging than acute instances of abuse. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. The, the child that is abused potentially may get pretty good nurturance along the way it's just that their parent periodically loses it on them. With neglect, that's more like chronic emotional malnutrition. You just never do get the groceries. And that ends up being more damaging than those acute instances of abuse. And what happens from that is that there's inadequate stability or security and parental attachments because the kid recognizes their parent is not plugged into them. There's inadequate stability or security in daily life or practical care. You're not getting baths. The household's a mess. You're not picked up on time. Uh, basic physical and emotional needs go unmet. Uh, and it ends up distorting the primary structures uh, that childhood is supposed to develop. Kids are very egocentric, and so they experience the world in terms of themselves. And so if there's nobody plugged in to actually be looking after me, then the world seems out of control. And, that, and the child feels incompetent. Is the child is not experiencing his significance in the dedicated minutes and hours that their parents spend nurturing and structuring his experience. It isn't that they're inadequate parents. I must be unimportant. I must be defective. When mom leaves him, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with her. It means he's unlovable. So they're creating these very significant self-definitions. And also, as there is not this external structure that's so important to move from the outside to the inside during childhood, then this individual ends up not having sufficient internal controls about who they are and what they're doing, which is part of what happened in this offense as well. So these kids are at markedly increased risk for psychological disorder, and they're at markedly increased risk for behavior problems in childhood and violent and criminal behavior in childhood and adulthood. Your Honor, um, before we get into the next topic, I, I don't know if it would be appropriate to break for the day or take a short break, um, but we've been at it for a while. Uh, any objection to breaking for the day? No objection. I would just ask about how much time we're estimating remaining with the direct examination um, of this witness. We are about two-thirds of the way through the direct examination. So no objection to breaking then? Okay, we will uh, recess and reconvene at 9 o'clock sharp tomorrow.